Okay, so I think I was able to get through. Excellent. I was able to get through everything pretty quickly. Um, so we're very excited. Like I said earlier, um, we had tried to get this going earlier this year, but with, with schedules not working out, we were very excited that uh, Dr. Pablo Diaz is willing to be our uh, kickoff presenter for our 2024-25 series. And so um, uh, he's he's been involved very, very deeply in sustainable and domestic materials scale for the solar industry. He's, uh, he's been doing a lot of research, he's been published. And more than more than anything, I don't think it's it's a value for me to to share a whole lot, because I'd really like to hear more from your perspective. And so I'd be more thrilled than anything else to turn this over to our guest speaker this evening. And we'll stop sharing here. And... All right. Am I coming through all right? Yes, you are. All right. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and just, you know, because we talked about the hub and the uh, career opportunities, I'm, right off the bat, I'm going to say that SolarCycle has been growing tremendously and we're always looking out for passionate people. Engineers always have space in a company. So if this anything that you hear from today you know, resonates with you and you think this is an interesting career for you, just definitely reach out because there's a lot of opportunities at SolarCycle at the moment. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and let me talk, I want to talk to you guys about um, the circular economy idea for solar, um, you know, that solar can have a second life as was the title of the presentation. Um, this is a, um, a very, um, it's a very, a talk that I'm very passionate about. It involves everything that we've been doing at Solar Cycle and what I've been working on for the past uh, almost decade and a half now. Um, when I first started looking into this, you know, it wasn't even a problem back in the day, right? If, you know, if you go 15 years back, you know, solar panels were already a thing, but we didn't have much volumes out there. So people were not really concerned about how to recycle or what to do if, at end of life. But uh, we now have a good problem in a way because solar has become a very much popular form of energy. So therefore, we do need to find solutions for it. And um, it's very interesting that I think today we're, we find ourselves in a time that is unique, a unique time in history. We have an opportunity to lead the way and we can picture the future. Uh, we can picture, you know, 20, 20 50, as you know, if you, if you go into the future and picture what where we're going to be in 2050, um, you know, net zero society with um, solar being the the primary form of energy that we have in the world, and uh, you know, cir complete circular economy, meaning that we're not extracting things from uh, mining or extracting things from nature any more than we already have. We're basically just mining through the materials that we have already. Um, um, extracted and, and, and resources somehow. Um, and we, I think we are at the point today that we can do that. Uh, I'll explain why during this presentation. Uh, and it will be amazing to show, to lead the way in the circular economy with the renewable energy industry um, of the future. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about. I want to show you what circular economy could look like. Obviously, solar cycle is a big part of this, but it's way, it's bigger than, than the company itself. So let me see if I can move right. All right, so I'm gonna start you know, pulling the lens way back and talking about what is even circular economy to kick things off. And basically, you know, there's different uh, definitions, but, um, and I'm gonna talk high level about the three uh, key definitions, the economic one, the materials one, and the thermodynamics one. Um, if we talk about the economics, we think about economics, it's like um, the idea of donut economics. This is something that some here might be familiar with. It's the idea of respecting external planetary boundaries without while fulfilling the internal societal needs. And you know, in practice, what that means is we take enough to be able to fulfill our needs as a person in a society. We have enough resources, enough food, enough water, enough shelter to be able to um, keep all the society at a uh, comfort level. But we're not overshooting, going beyond what the planet, uh, planet Earth can replenish, right? So this idea of being able to extract all we need and be in balance with nature, and this is very much rooted in uh, the field of economics. If we get then switch the lens to like a more material approach and um, start talking more about the engineering side of things, then what we get is um, the idea of circular economy is that today we live in a linear economy in which we take, make, use and discard and dispose of the materials to one in which uh, after extracting, we're able to reuse that resource 
to its full extent without really throwing it away, right? So whenever we um, mine something off the ground, whenever we extract some some resource, we use it to the full extent, and basically we're avoiding uh, landfilling materials to the as much as we possibly can. Um, note, however, that this still has the take component there. So if we were to go uh, and you know apply the circular economy with this perspective here, we would still be extracting resources from Earth. So it's not fully circular. We're just really stopping the uh, end of this uh, linear economy and not really stopping and not creating the full circularity. And what that means in you know in terms of equilibrium and reaching a, a stop of extraction is that we would have infinite resources if we're able to do reach a, a true circular economy, and everything that we extract that we extract is replenishable somehow. The easiest way to think about it, if we think about materials. Right, is to think about organics versus inorganic materials. That gives, gives us a, a rough approximation. If we think about like you know an apple, as long as we're extracting uh, apples off the trees the same rate at, at which they are replenishable over a year time or give a certain time period, that's in balance. That's sustainable. Uh, if we're extracting more than uh, and nature cannot keep up with it, that's not sustainable. But then when we get to inorganic materials, that's not as easy to quantify because you know being replenishable is, has a different meaning. So basically, if you think about a copper, right, and making a copper wire for a building, as long as we're able to recover that copper wire to make a new building in the future, we're not needing to extract more copper off the ground, that would be what a sustainable circular economy means. So we can go and look at the different types of materials, you know, the, the, the four big categories, ceramics, metals, polymers, and composites, and um, try to put that uh, perspective into the different types of materials to really understand what a circular economy would look like. And then we go into the third lens, which to me, it's the most interesting one, um, which is that of thermodynamics, right? Because through thermodynamics, uh, at first glance, the circular economy is a fairy tale because we have this pesty thing called the second law of thermodynamics, which you guys are probably very familiar with, that says that we there's limits to it, right? So while uh, metals are infinitely recyclable, every time you recycle it, you lose a little bit of it, right? Those, you never get a, a basically, you know, in a nutshell, you never have a process that's 100% efficient. So every time that you recycle, you're losing a little bit, even if it's just a combination of all your processes from uh, from uh, collection all the way to end processing to get that, that resource back. So it's, it's interesting because there is a limit to recycling. Um, limits are imposed. Some of them are uh, societal, so not nothing to do with thermodynamics. So some of them are just, you know, the behavior of, of uh, putting things into right bins and separating things beforehand to ensure that we get higher collection rates, all the way to product design to making things that are easier to recycle and extract and separate to increase those rates, all the way to obviously recycling technology so that you can maximize the rate of recovery. But at the same time, because of the thermodynamics of separation, that's what the graph on the right shows, um, you do have a loss just because of um, diffusion and migration of different particles over time as you're doing these processes, right? It doesn't matter if you're doing a recycling process or if you're extracting things from the ground and doing the primary metallurgy, you're always gonna have a little bit of loss along the way. So under this lens, if you look at this and say, okay, I need to achieve 100% efficiency to be able to close the loop and really have a circular economy, then the second law of thermodynamics comes in and says, no, this is not possible, you can't do it. However, and this is you know the key and the heart of the talk today is, I want to show you guys why we can achieve circular economy with, uh, in spite of the second law of thermodynamics without breaking the second law, because I don't think anybody would believe me if I said this doesn't apply. So without breaking the second law of thermodynamics, we can still achieve the circular economy. Um, we're in a perfect storm right now. It's a perfect confluence of factors right now in the solar industry to do that. Um, and I think, like I said in the beginning, if we are able to achieve this, this is not going to be revolutionary for the solar industry and for the renewable energy industry, but just for the, the world at home, because I think we can lead the way and show a different path forward. All right, so what is this, this perfect storm that I'm talking about? So it's a confluence of factors, um, and I'm going to talk about each of these uh, one at a time. So it's a combination of you know building more solar resources to achieve net zero. It's a combination of the negative views on solar because of the waste. It's a combination of reusing panels, a combination of learning rates we've achieved so far and advancements in recycling. So let's go at these one at a time so I can explain why we're in this perfect storm today. So again, um, I always like to take a few steps back and remind like 
go pull the pull the lanes back and then go into uh you know the specifics we're here today and we're talking solar is so important it's become so big and it's you know such a pressing topic because of climate change because of our addiction to fossil fuels and because of the need that we have to move away from them right so uh we you know we are already approaching um, catastrophic levels in many parts of the world. We're seeing, you know, devastating floods above um, base ground levels. We're seeing, you know, hurricanes for that matter, recent in front of mine. We're seeing severe droughts, heat waves. And uh, one key thing that we need to address the climate crisis is to achieve net zero, right? To stop uh, pumping carbon into the atmosphere. And achieving net zero requires way more solar. So, when I say way more solar, when I say that people generally understand, but I think when we quantify it, it's like a bit of a shocker for some people. Uh, we are today in the world, we have deployed, give or take about 1.4 terawatt hours of uh, installed capacity. Uh, sorry, terawatt peak, not hours, terawatt peak. Um, 1.4, okay. To be able to achieve net zero, right, the most conservative estimates are those of the IEA, which call for 10x what we have deployed so far. So the solar industry in the last many years, in the last decade, I can say, has seen exponential growth, right? Exponential growth is something that we're very, uh, humans are very, um, they have a very big problem, you know, understanding really exponential growth because it's not, you know, as natural as some other uh, linear projections that we have. So it's been exponential so far and we've deployed massive amount of solar. Like if you've seen the amount of solar farms that we have in the United States and China, Western Europe, Japan, um, Australia, um, Latin America now, it's been a massive growth. And in spite of that growth, we still need to 10x that at a minimum to be able to achieve net zero by 2050. It's just um, the amount of solar that we need to deploy is mind blowing. And like I said, this is the most conservative one, which is the IEA, which has is notorious for being uh, conservative when it comes to projections for solar. Um, more, uh, I'd say, aggressive projections like the one from the ITRPV, which I'm showing here, call for 63 terawatt peak by 2050, right? So again, we're at 1.4 today. So this is, you know, 30X, uh, 50X, depending on the projections of where we are today. Um, and this is no small feat. To be able to do this, we need, you know, all, all the industry that has developed so far, we need it to grow significantly more. And making solar panels, it's not like um, that doesn't require resources, right? So making solar panels require more res resources. So more solar means, you know, more aluminum, more glass, more silver, more um, copper, more of all these resources that are required to make a solar panel. And what I have on the left hand side is just the cumulative demand for aluminum that we have for the for the making of solar panels. So the aluminum demand, you know, according to this projection that we've published in uh, Nature Sustainability, is that you know the demand that we have by 2050 is over 40% of the demand that we have today. Okay, so 40% of the aluminum demand that we have today. The aluminum industry is ginormous, right? So, you know, it's the industry that supplies for cars, for construction work, for aerospace industry, for uh, electronics, and solar is a small part of it. If, you know, we project how much we need and where we're going to 2050, we're gonna be consuming 40% of what the industry produces today. It's a, a huge amount of, um, of aluminum. And on the right-hand side, what I have is the cumulative silver demand, right? So maintaining business as usual with the dominance of P-type already has changed to N-type, which actually takes up more um, silver. The um, By 2050, we, would, we could see solar dominating like 100% of the silver markets, 100% of the silver reserves. So this is not to say this is impossible or it can be done or, you know, it's just to say we need a lot of resources to be able to get there. And, you know, Yes, of course, we can find new reserves, we can find uh, better ways to mine things, and we can get more things off the ground. But there, um, this uh, the growth that is needed for the solar industry does require a significant amount of resources. And then it's not like these resources are becoming more and more abundant, right? As a matter of fact, it's other way around. Um, the idea is that the more that we extract, the we're always getting the lower hanging fruits. So the more that we extract off the ground, the harder it is to get the next batch, right? And what I'm showing here on the left is basically your average ore grade for silver. And on the right, you have your average uh, ore grade for copper, right? So that means that if you look at the copper there, we started at one, um, basically 1%. So every time that you remove, you know, 100 tons of uh, basically earth through mining, 1% of that would be copper. 
and the trend is downward. So now you're about half of that. So every, you know, 100 tons we extract, only half a percent there is copper. And on the silver, obviously silver is more rare. So we're talking about, we were at 440 grams per ton. So 400 grams every ton of material that we extract and mine. And again, the trend is downward and we've seen a 30% decrease over time. So this is just to say, you know, while we do need way, way more resources to be able to build the industry that we need for net zero, we also have these resources becoming more scarce. And obviously there's a big environmental impact associated with extracting these resources. So it's um, that's the first, you know, picture that I paint for you guys. It's that first part of the confluence of factors. It's like, we need to achieve net zero. To achieve net zero, we need to build way more solar um, to you know, on, to be able to put our renewable energy portfolio out there, uh, anywhere from 10x to 60x growth from where we are today, and this requires way more resources. So that's the first reason. Let's go on to the second reason. The second reason is um, solar has been seeing um, a lot of negative media recently. Um, it's been talking about the dark side of solar. We're talk talking about megatons of toxic waste. Um, black eye for the green energy. Um, it's, it has all this, this media attention around uh, the waste that solar panels generate. Um, and indeed, if we don't treat these panels properly, if we don't have a plan for them at end of life, they do end up at landfill, right? And it's a big uh, waste of resource for everything we just saw so far. And it's interesting because this media attention is one of the roadblocks that we have in the front of solar because we've seen communities now worried about What's going to happen with the solar panels if they're installed, you know, next door? Like, are people just going to leave and leave behind these solar panels that don't have any? Um, there's no path for them forward after the the plant's gone. So this has been, you know, more and more front of mind, front and center of mind for uh, those who are installing the asset owners and the manufacturers of solar panels. While this is true and obviously it needs to be addressed and needs to be um, understood, it's also very good to put it in perspective, right? So. Uh, an excellent paper came out recently from um, NREL here in the United States, which basically puts in perspective what the solar waste is, right? So you got your PV waste here in 2016, basically non-existent, when you compare it to um, e-waste, oil sludge, plastic waste, co-ash, or municipal solid waste, right? And the projections of the megatons that we expect to see by uh, 2050 is this cube right here, right? So there's a small cube, which is like best case scenario and this uh, lighter cube here, which is the worst case scenario. And again, um, it, this is not to say like, don't worry about it. Like we don't have to, we don't have a problem. It's just to say like, this is completely overblown in the media. If you look at the big picture of what we're talking about in terms of waste being generated. So this is the second um, confluence of factors. Uh, when we go back to our, you know, overall, this is the negative views of the media that's basically pushing for solutions, right? So um, because communities are now asking, what is the plan for end of life? That pushes asset owners to have a plan for end of life, which then pushes the manufacturers to not only think about end of life, but also to work with companies that are uh, doing recycling uh, in the USA and elsewhere. So that's our second reason why we have this confluence of factors. Now, the third reason is something that's really cool. And um, I have uh, worked at UNSW who's been on the very forefront of this, which is just the amazing um, push that, you know, engineers such as yourselves have been able to accomplish so far. So the amount of uh, material consumption per unit power, right, CPP is coined by my colleague, Brett Hallam, uh, which is basically a measurement of how much uh, power we get with how much uh, material input has been steadily um, becoming better and better. So we need less and less material to get more and more um, uh, power, right? So the CPP has been going down over time. What I show here is an example for silicon. So we have um, the, the 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 historical uh, CPP for silicon over time. And this is one is taking the curve loss into account, the other one's not. And then projections downwards, right? So the industry so far has been amazing at doing more with less. Um, on the right-hand side, what I'm showing is uh, basically the idea of how much glass is being used in solar panels. And here you're, we're going from a industry that was dominated by uh, three uh, millimeter glass panes all the way down to less than two millimeters now. And we see this transaction going from over three millimeters to between two, two and three and now uh, less than two millimeters. So we have a trend with using less glass as well. 
And this can also be seen for other materials like silver. So this is a material consumption for silver over time for solar panels. And uh, you know, this this is the historical one and it's been going steadily down. We're measuring here the amount of milligrams of silver per area of a cell. And then this is a projected uh, going forward. Same thing here using the project, um, the historical one and then projecting it um, as we scale and as we increase the cumulative capacity of PV in the world, right? So here we have different scenarios, the IEA 21 uh, net zero, we have the ITR PV broad electr electrification, and these are different scenarios of how much PV we're gonna have installed, but the clear trend is downwards, right? So CPP uh, has been becoming better and better, meaning we're able to do more and more with less, which is amazing, especially considering what I said in the beginning, the amount of resources we're gonna need to be able to deploy to get to net zero. So this is the third reason in our confluence of factors. We already talked about building more solar and how that's gonna require more resources. Um, we talked about the negative views of solar by the media. Um, and now we're talking about the learning rates and how we've been able to decrease the resource needed per watt steadily. And that we project that that's going to continue into the future. I should probably point out that, you know, for those of you who are familiar with solar panels, it's not like a smooth, trend downwards. Every once in a while, we get like top con, for instance, which is the latest technology that's been dominated, has increased the amount of silver it requires per cell. But even after that spike with that technology, it still continues downwards. So in spite of some spikes, the trend is downwards. Now we move into the, the, fourth, um, the fourth factor in this confluence of factors, which is um, very close to my heart, but it's the end of life scenarios and the, the recycling rates. So the first thing is how much um, solar do we expect to see at end of life? The studies that we have seen on this, especially, you know, studies from five years ago, they have severely underestimated the amount of material that is available. So, for instance, this is um, the World Bank study, um, the Minerals for Climate Action. It's a big study from the World Bank. It was um, very important for many um, investments and uh, many other areas in the energy sector. This is from 2020. This study, when it looks at solar end of life, it assumes that solar panels are going to last for 30 years on average. So, um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about how long they last, but just in a nutshell, um, 30 years is like what they're warranted for. And if they're kept in place and uh, protected from the environment, then 30 years is definitely possible. But the average lifetime is, has we've been seeing is less than that. The other thing that is, is that is assumes, and this is, a big um, problem in this report is that we would have four terawatts by 2050. Like this is um, very um, extremely conservative, put it this way. Like I said, we're already at 1.4 today, right? This is 2024, we're already at 1.4. We have the capacity of producing half a terawatt per year, basically just in China. China alone can do half a terawatt per year. So we expect to see four terawatts in the next two to three years. Right, it's definitely um, not going to be by 2050, and if it is by 2050, we have a big problem because of what we see in the beginning to achieve net zero and how much we need there. Um, but in spite of this, you know, this study shows that you know secondary aluminum, secondary aluminum meaning recycled aluminum, can meet 61 percent of the demand for uh, 2050 under a 100 percent recycling rate scenario. 100% recycling rates and areas is great. You know, that's what we want to achieve. Uh, it's not where we are today. So this is to show, you know, we've had severe um, underestimates uh, when it comes to end of life and the potential for it, because this not only assumes that panels are going to last more than they do, but it also assumes we're going to have way less panels than we need. Um, if we look at end of life in numbers, there's a very famous graph from Irina. Um, this has been very outdated because this is from 2016 and we have had much better figures since then. Um, this also assumes an average lifetime of 30 years. Um, this uh, right here is showing there's basically two projections. There's a regular one, which is a light gray, and the early loss scenario, which is a dark gray. Um, all the numbers that we've seen so far, they basically correlate with the dark gray. So the dark gray is where we should have like our base and depending on the country you're in, this is actually overshoots. So in the USA, if you were to take this graph here and say this is, um, and compare it to what we've seen in the USA, um, this is 10X off, off by 10X, 
Now, I don't think the USA is very representative of the rest of the world, so we can't say that, you know, this is 10x for everywhere, but with uh, specific years that we've been looking at, this has been 10x off for the USA. Um, so what I want to say here is early loss scenarios, I think the baseline that we should be looking at and obviously updating this to be able to have more reliable numbers on what to expect um, from end of life coming from PV. And the reason for this, the reason why we're seeing so much more waste than was expected is basically because of the average lifetime. So solar panels are amazing devices. They're made to last. They can very well last, you know, 30, 35 years as the warranty on those products is. Um, but there's all these other reasons that come into play uh, to lower this average lifetime. Um, some of them are um, uh, the install breakage, right? So if you're off in the field and you're installing, there's always a percentage that break while you're installing because of mishaps, because of forklift that go in the wrong place, because of drops. And that automatically, you know, takes your life that was supposed to be 30 to zero, right? Your brand new panel hasn't even operated, broken, goes to zero. And if it's an average, that's starting to pull the lifetime uh, down. Uh, some other things that we've seen is um, uh, economic motivation. Like often there's um, installations that are still operating. They could very well stay operating for another decade. But because the market has been so good at be become doing panels that are better and better, um, it's not worthwhile to keep them there operating. You're better off putting new panels in. So basically you come to end of life earlier than you would otherwise. Then there's the, you know, damage and technical failures. There's um, power decreases, which is expected, right? That tells decrease over time. That's why we have uh, the 30 years and not infinite lifetime. So you put everything into, uh, you aggregate all these things, you aggregate social factors, you aggregate um, the big hailstorms and floods and, you know, uh, climate catastrophes that we've been seeing that unfortunately also hit solar panels. And that all compiles and brings that average lifetime from the 30, 35, that's usually used down to a 15, 20, your average lifetime as we've published in this um, paper that you guys can read later if you're interested. What that means, right, the reason why this is relevant to our talk today is that there's way more um, end-of-life solar available, right, resources available than was otherwise projected in the beginning when we first started deploying these panels. And then last but definitely not least, when we're talking about end-of-life and recycling, uh, there has been a big advancement in uh, the technology for recycling, right? Obviously, this is um, at the heart of what we do at Solar Cycle, we're trying to push the envelope there and trying to do uh, be better and better at basically reaching this end of life recycling rate, which is a combination of how much we can collect, right? How much is out there and how much we're actually bringing in, um, how much we can pre-process. So that's you know your first processing to be able to uh, separate the big components out, and then your end processing, which is literally when you go into the smelting phases and your electrochemical processes to be able to collect that resource, make it into a new resources to send to the supply chain. So we've been pushing the envelope on all these fronts at Solar Cycle, trying to get maximize the amount of aluminum we can extract, glass, precious metals, and plastics from a solar panel. And this has been a, a steady trend as well, the maximization of recycling that we've seen over time, um, which contributes to our last factor. So um, on that last factor on the, on the far right, it's basically we have more resource available because the average lifetime is, low, is less than we've seen otherwise. Um, and we've been able to extract more and more because of the advancements of recycling. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the four factors. We need way more solar to be able to achieve that zero. That requires way more resources. There have been negative views on solar by the media due to the waste that can uh, occur at end of life if untreated. Um, we have been getting better and better at using, uh, deploying more energy, using less material. And we've also been, been getting better at extracting those materials when end of life comes, okay? And also the amount of available material has been increasing steadily. So now we get to um, the final piece of the puzzle there on the bottom, which is the risk of reusing. Because the whole idea behind the waste hierarchy is that we um, can reuse before we recycle. But if we just take these four that we've seen so far, we actually get to a key point in this whole talk, which is this graph right here. And this graph is something that we've worked on um, from a couple of years ago, and there's a lot going on, so I'm gonna break it down. Um, this is something that we're looking specifically for silver, right? Looking at silver, and we're trying to see how relevant is the silver from in the fly from recycling for the new solar panels that we need to make. So to, to do that, let's concentrate on the left-hand side first. What we did is, okay, 
What was the um, annual production of solar panels per year? How much have we deployed? And we have good data on that and we can look into the past and get you know um, how much has been deployed so far. And we can look at how much silver was used in that um, in those panels because we know which panels have been deployed. We know the technology, we know how much silver they required. So we know exactly how much silver is out there as a stranded asset, right? So that's when we look into the past. Then what we do is we project that into the future. And then we need a couple of things to be able to look into the future. One is what is gonna be the deployment rate? So here on this top right here, I have the IEA slow scenario. We also have this for different scenarios, but this is specifically for the IEA slow scenario. What's gonna be the deployment rate of solar over the years, right? In terms of the terawatt per year deployment. The other projection that we do is how much silver we're going to need to be able to do this deployment, right? And we just talked about the CPP and how we've been getting the learning rates there. So we've projected what's the learning rates and what we expect to see into the future. And if there's no learning rates, then this is what we expect in terms of silver uh, consumption to be able to deploy the new panels. If we see the current lear learning rates continue into the future, this is what we see this, this, this bottom trend here, right? So what we're saying with this shaded gray is, you know, the silver consumption can be anywhere in between the both. Like if we don't do anything about it and we completely stop R&D today in solar development, then we're going to get the dotted line at top. If we continue the excellent, amazing rates we've been seeing so far, we get the one on the bottom. Truth is probably somewhere in the middle, so therefore that, therefore that's why we have the shade in the middle. So if we look into the past, we know how much was deployed. Uh, we know how much silver is out there. We uh, get all that data, and then we project that into the future. We can see how relevant is this silver for the new solar panels that we need. And that's where we get to this graph here, right? So this graph is looking exactly at that. Like what's the percentage of future PV silver demand that can be met by silver in end of life panels? In other words, whenever I hit 100%, it means that I have all the silver that I need from old panels, okay? This obviously is assuming that we're recycling 100%, which is not the, the truth today, unfortunately, but um, it's where we wanna be. And basically what changes is how long these panels are going to last for. If the average lifetime of the panels is 10 years, right, then the uh, silver is going to be available much sooner to us. And therefore we get this yellow shade line here. If the average lifetime is 17 years, which is what I just told you guys, it's uh, closer to reality, then we get this green shade here. And if the average lifetime is closer to 25, then we get this orange, um, reddish shade of gray here. Uh, shade of uh, um, uh, orange here. So this is, uh, to me anyways, this is a super interesting graph. I think when we first set out to do this, we didn't know what to expect. I was, you know, my guess would be like, you know, probably can hit 10% of the demand. I never expected to see what you guys are seeing in front of you. So the key thing here is that, oops, the key thing here is that at some point we crossed this magical line here, this magical line of 100%, right? Let me get a pin. This magical line, if I could draw straight, this would be the 100% here. But no matter what scenario we're talking about, we always cross that 100% magical line. And that's the magical line that all of a sudden enables circular economy. Because if you guys think about it, what this means is once we're at this point in time, so right, if we're talking to 17 years, we're crossing that line at about 2040, right? And if we're not that good with our um, learning rates, it's probably going to be later. But once we cross this magical threshold here, what this means is there's enough silver in end of life solar panels to supply all the silver that we need to make the new panels that we need for the future, for uh, net zero, right? And once we go above this 100%, then we're not limited by the second law anymore because the second law says basically you're never going to be able to reach your 100%, right? Never going to be able to hit, reach 100% recycling, but we don't need to re reach 100% recycling as long as we have more than 100% requirement uh, available as stranded materials, and we can have a little bit of losses along the way, right? So once we cross the threshold here, this red line, this is when it. This is when we look at this, and we, you know, mathematically with first uh, principles of physics, we can say, yes, the circular economy is possible as long as we work towards it. As long as we work towards collecting this material, extracting, doing all the processing, and continue our learning rates to ensure that we can make more out of less. So this to me is a very powerful graph, and it's one of the key parts of this whole presentation it's you know where we see this is possible this is not a fairy tale it's just a matter of us you know working together and making sure that we can achieve this because if we don't 
we're going to basically be uh, you know polluting more our planet while trying to save it. And this is basically a shortcut in which we can do uh, with way less energy and way less resource extraction. So with that, um, you know, hopefully with that message conveyed, and I'm sure uh, there might be some questions about this later, uh, we can go into the last piece of the puzzle down there, which is the idea of reuse, right? Which I purposely leave at the end because reusing is amazing. The idea of reusing is should and uh, come first before recycling, but there's also a risk to reuse. And we've seen this happen over and over um, in different countries. We've seen uh, panels be sent to different countries uh, for reuse and then no proper oversight on what's going to happen with them after um, end of life. There's a big, big difference between reusability and resellability. So we see uh, panels that are still functional and can be reused, but cannot be resold in the country, for instance, because the, um, because the purchasing power, because of the cost of new panels. Um, so where these panels are going and where what's going to happen with them at end of life is something that's extremely important to uh, think through before just uh, enabling reuse um, willy-nilly. So at Solar Cycle, this has been part of the key things that we do. And you see here, um, basically two trends have contributed to making reuse harder. One is just the price of new solar panels, right? It's just, it's dropped dramatically over time, which is great, right? It's great. Um, it's great that we've been able to achieve this. But what that means is if you take a 10 year old panel and you compare it to a new one today, that 10 year old panel now has way lower potential and its value is not as much as one that's new, right? Because the new one costs way less than it would cost 10 years ago. And in addition to that, we've been amazed, we've been, you know, uh, getting amazing results at getting more and more power out of a single panel. So that old panel compared to the new panel, not only does the economic value of it is, uh, doesn't really pencil out, but also the power of the new panel might be 2x that of a 10 year old panel. So that makes the um, reuse case uh, much harder to pencil out in a domestic scenario than, um, than uh, sending this internationally. And when you do send it internationally, then you start getting into other problems like I just showed. So to address this problem at SolarCycle specifically, what we have, our vision, our whole idea, is that you would have to um, find a way to reuse these panels domestically. If there are projects that we can do domestically, if there are use cases for it domestically, then all we're all for it and we're gonna support it. But if it needs to go overseas, then um, the conversation changes a bit. And to be able to accomplish our vision, what we have is, you know, this idea, this idea of a gigafactory in which we're able to do um, value-added products and recycling with a reusable energy uh, solar field, a second and second-hand solar field, solar farm on the back. So the the idea being here that you know a panel comes to us, we're able to test it. If it's still good, if it still has a life to it, we can deploy it in the field. We can take energy for as long as it's still functioning. And then at the end of life, we can recycle it on site because our recycling is right there. You don't have to send it, you know, a couple of times and increase that logistics cost and that pollution due to logistics. So this is not only a vision and, you know, idea in our minds. We actually have this ongoing already. There's a video uh, you can check out in our website or on uh, LinkedIn that shows our first of a kind secondhand recycling farm. We've, um, you know, launched this, I think, a couple of months ago. Um, it's been online, it's been supplying energy for our recycling process, by the way, which is pretty cool. Uh, and we, our idea is, you know, after collecting data from this one to deploy a bigger one on our next recycling facility. So this is pretty cool. And it's our answer to how to um, ensure that reuse is part of the, part of the uh, hierarchy, because it is um, better to reuse a panel to its full extent before recycling it without necessarily sending this overseas to markets that will not have the proper oversight or the proper regulations to deal with this at end of life. And then the last piece of my talk today that I wanna talk to you guys about is literally that last piece of the puzzle that is missing there from the um, from the, the confluence of factors. It's the the catch, right? So there's, there's, there's this one catch, which is the market. And the reason why the market is a catch is the following. Um, we can very well extract all the resources from a solar panel and we can you know have perfect material ready to go to the supply chain but if there's no markets to absorb that material to be able to do something with that material then 
um, there's no there's there's no point in doing the recycle, right? So if I were to extract the aluminum frame, um, again, perfect piece of aluminum, ready to go, ready to make a new part. And there's no one willing to take that aluminum frame to make a new part. Then there's no point in recycling it. Uh, and for the materials that we have in the solar panel, the aluminum frame is easy. Like we can, there's always off takers for that. There's always, you know, people wanting that. The glass is somewhat easy because we can sell it today, but I'll talk about the glass more in a second. There's no shortage of people wanting to buy our precious metals. So, you know, we have silver, we have copper, we have tin, we have uh, silicon in there. Um, there's no lack of uh, market for this. There is a lack of market for the plastics, right? The plastics are, some of them are cross-linked for those who are more familiar with uh, polymers. Some of them are uh, thermal uh, plastics, some are not. So it's a harder material to find a good home for. But in the case of glass specifically, which is you know a great uh, case study because it's 70% plus of the weight of a panel, you can use that glass for many different things. And basically you can rank them in terms of entropy here, uh, in terms of how can I use this low iron glass? This is a very special glass. You need all the solar oh. energy through it. You need, you know, to the, oh. the uh, uh, you can't have it absorbing energy that would otherwise go through the silicon. So it has to be very special in terms of its chemistry. So the best possible use for a glass extracted from a solar panel is to make it into a new solar glass. That's, you know, hands down the best possibility. Then you can also use it to make, you know, um, this place, so the, the, this, the, the glass that you have in your electronics. Um, you can use it for architectural glass. It's still, it's good for that. Um, it's more pure than you would need. Automotive, you can use it for aquariums, packaging fillers. And then fillers on the bottom here is like when you would use it for, you know, concrete or for asphalt or different application as fillers. So today the industry can take it to make different products, but the industry cannot do solar glass. So while we can extract this and we can, you know, um, send this material back to the supply chain, we can't make it, uh, stay at its same level of entropy. And that kind of breaks the whole idea that I was talking about the circular economy, because if you can't really make the product with the same entropy, then you're going to have to extract the resources from um, earth again to be able to make a new solar glass, which is what we need because of the demand for materials. So because of that, SolarCycle as a company, and because we see ourselves not just as a recycling company, but really a circular economy company, our premise is Whenever the market is not there, and you know we don't think like the market, we don't think the market's able of absorbing what we're creating. We're going to do it ourselves, and because of that, you know our whole idea is to enable the solar power circular economy. So there's this economy of there's panel makers, you know your OEMs of the world. There are the people that buy these panels and deploy them to be able to generate energy and create your solar farms and your commercials, utility scales. Then solar cycle comes in as the recycler that takes these panels at end of life and extracts them. We do a full wipe left service. We go to the field, we collect these panels, we bring them in, we do our recycling process, we extract the materials. And then whenever the market is not there, when the market is there, it's easy. We just sell the material and they create the value added products. We don't have to, to do anything. But if the market is not there, like in the case of glass that I just said, then we step up and we create value added process ourselves. So we became our, become our own customer by taking the materials in and by making products. And because of you know this whole idea of circular economy, circularity, and trying to be a true, um, trying to achieve, sorry, trying to achieve true circularity, we're actually um, creating a solar uh, glass manufacturing plant in Georgia that you guys might have seen uh, announcements for. We are breaking ground this year. It's about a two-year build, so we're going to be manufacturing in the USA rolled glass for solar panels. There's no manufacturer of rolled glass today in the USA. We'll, we will be obviously incorporating recycled glass from a recycling process into the manufacturing of this glass. This will be, um, we'll have from our estimates about 30% less embodied carbon due to the use of the recycled content and due to the fact it's domestic. Uh, it's going to be powered by secondhand solar panels or we will have our uh, secondhand farms in the back, just like we have in our recycling facility. And obviously we're also going to have recycling right on site so we don't have big logistics problems sending it back and forth. So that's, you know, um, that's the vision. That's what we intend on seeing. And that's why, you know, I started this talk talking about like, what can the circular economy look like uh, for solar? I've talked about like the constraints that we have around the thermodynamics. It's, I've shown you guys that there is a possibility. There's no uh, physical law that stops us from doing this. It's basically just willpower in markets and economics. 
And where the market is there, then it's easy. We're, you know, best partner and we're here to, to help them. If the market is not there, we're just going to do it ourselves. So that concludes my talk. Um, if you guys have any interest on the reference list, you can uh, scan the QR code on the bottom right. You can feel free to get in touch with me with my email which is in the bottom left. And I'm obviously happy to take some questions now and talk more about this wonderful topic. All right. So um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and put a, a question in the chat or if, um, if we run out of questions in the chat, we can always open it up for people to unmute themselves and to ask their questions live. Um, we do not seem to have anything in the chat other than some, some great presentations, thank you comments, which is awesome. Um, so if you do have questions, please feel free. I invite you to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. So my, I guess my first question would be, um, how do you, how do you then market your message to either the OEMs or the installers who are out there working with uh, collecting old modules? What's your process in in getting Solar Cycles name out there, um, or so getting the the recycling process kind of out there for people to know about? So o OEMs and solar panel manufacturers are generally not out there collecting panels, right? They um, generally um, end of life comes second uh, after, you know, the, it's it's not the first thing you think about. The, we're, we're changing this a bit with our approach. We're working with the biggest asset owners in the country. And today what happens, Heather, is recycling costs more than landfilling. Unfortunately, that's a true reality today. It costs more to recycle a panel than to landfill one. So our whole vision around solar cycle is to bring that cost down so that it's on pair and there it's a no brainer, right? So you don't have to think about whether you want to do the right thing for the environment or if you want to uh, save, you can, it's just one option. So our strategy has been to be, to work with the largest solar asset manufacturer, uh, sorry, solar asset holders. Um, we're a partner of 80 of the 120 biggest asset owners in the country today. And the other thing that's pretty cool is because we're inserted on that loop, if you go back here, because we're inserted on both um, this, let me get my pointer again, on this end of the um, the chain and also on this end here, what we, um, we're we now doing is working with panel makers to talk about design for recycling, right? So the more, the easier it is to recycle a panel, the less this cross here, the more value added we can have here and the less cost we can have here, which then translates to a lower cost for them for these products. So we're actually working on both fronts. And also if you are helping manufacturers understand about the using the recycled product in their new manufacturing, that hopefully then creates that demand. Absolutely. Yep. For you. It's, okay. it's definitely it's definitely a flywheel that we're starting to spin now, but it, it's one that we hope to be able to spin faster and faster. Great. We've got a couple of questions here in the chat now. Uh, is there the possibility that used solar panels can be refurbished or renovated in the future? Uh, so solar panels can be refurbished today, not in the future. Um, they can. There's there's a few, like at Solar Cycle, when we do our testing, sometimes there's only uh, one or two problems with the panel that's easily to refurbish, like a broken diode, for instance, which is easy to, to, to fix. There are other companies in the U.S. that do that today as well. So this is definitely a possibility and a reality already today. And again, best use is to reuse the panels um, as long as they're kept domestic. That's you know ideal. But yeah, that's already a reality today. Great. All right. Um, another question: uh, How is the PV glass different than the normal soda lime glass uh, in chemical composition? More interested okay. in how it is being used in the construction industry. Okay, so uh, the key difference, uh, chemically speaking, is the amount of iron. So iron is um, a metal that will absorb some of the UV, uh, not the UV, so some of the, the light spectrum coming from the sun. And that spectrum is closely related to the, the, the spectrum that silicon absorbs. So having bigger amounts of iron in there means that you have a lower efficiency in your solar panel. For um, architectural glass, they don't care about that. That's not a big problem with them. So it's much 
cheaper to make a glass with higher iron contents than it is to make a solar glass, which requires lower iron contents. It all comes down to your raw material extraction, basically your sand, right? We're talking sand here. So you have either to buy a very fancy sand to make a solar panel, or you can buy a less fancy sand to make a window pane. So like I said, it's super easy. I can convert today. If you look at our website, you see that one of the machines that we have, we extract a full sheet of panel, like literally perfect extraction, 100% extraction of full sheet. That could very well be used in our uh, in uh, uh, windows and for architect purposes, for construction purposes. But the other way around is not possible. So I cannot take a window and make it into a solar glass because of the iron content. That's a key chemistry difference. Okay. I should also, uh, what, sorry, uh, there's one more detail no, since ahead. we're talking to engineers, I'll, I'll give one more detail um, yeah. about the, the glass. The other thing that's different is uh, when we're talking about construction glass, it's generally float glass, right? So it's a, it's a glass made in the float process. And for silicon solar panels, we use rolled glass. So it's a pattern glass. And the pattern has a, a few different reasons uh, when it comes to the, the the design of the solar panel. So that's another, another key difference. Um, there's slightly different chemistries between flow glass and uh, roll glass. And one of them is uh, antimony and can talk more details later, but those are I think, the two key differences. All right. What makes recycled solar glass unusable for solar PV again? And can it be readily used in the electronics industry? The second category you had on the on the degrees of entropy. Yeah, chart. it definitely can be used uh, in the electronics category. Um, was the question why it cannot be used for solar again? Is that, is that the, the frame? Yes, that was the that was the first question. Uh, what makes recycled solar glass unusable for solar PV again? No, no, but, but it's definitely usable, right? So it's so, so okay. usable that we're building that factory. So this whole idea around this factory here is that we are, as per this bullet here, incorporating recycled glass from solar to make new solar. And that's, again, that's the best uh, use that you can have for a solar glass extracted from a solar panel is to make a new glass for solar panels. So it can be uh, remelted and retransformed into solar glass. That's what we're trying to do um, with this big um, uh, fab, um, this big uh, fab that we're building in the Southeast of the USA. And yes, it can also be used for um, other, all the other applications that I've put here on the screen. These are all possible solar glass. Solar glass is the highest rank. So you can do anything lower than that, right? The lower you go, the more you're basically in wasting your, uh, organize the energy from your entropy into other products, but they, they're all good use cases. Excellent. Um, so another question came in about scalability and capacity needs. Uh, how many such recycling fa facilities would be required for a true circular economy for the entire solar supply chain? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, it's the, the black box there is China. All right, so I'm not be, I'm, not, I'm not able to answer that question fully because of China. It's um, the numbers in China are not totally clear to me today, but I can give you some idea in the USA. So in the USA, by having three facilities, three facilities like the ones that we have already in operation today, uh, we'll be able to do um, all the um, the solar that uh, North America produces. So we can serve um, all fifty states. We can serve um, you know the the uh, adjacent islands. We can serve. Uh, Canada and Mexico. Um, so that gives you a, a, an idea of the scale. So it's not that huge um, of an endeavor to be able to do it. All right. Okay. Um, is the amount of decommissioned panels sufficient to support uh, commercial viability of the business in the United States? Another great question. So it's all about uh, economies of scale and volumes today. Um, the Viability of the business, yes, there's enough volume today to support the viability of the business, you know, being being straight and direct with that answer. But I think just to expand a bit on that, the, because of the reasons that I've shown in this presentation, the, the average lifetime and all those things, the demand that we've been seeing for uh, our services have been uh, greater than any of us imagined. Like it's truly been <laughs> mind-blowing the amount of, of solar panels that need to be um, serviced and recycled. So much so that we're opening our third facility sooner than we thought we would be uh, opening. And that's going to be, uh, we're targeting to be able to do 10 million panels per year in that facility. So it's, a, it's you know, big numbers we're talking about already in the USA and only to increase given the exponential growth that we've seen in the deployment of solar in the USA and elsewhere. Excellent. What are your thoughts on the eco-effectiveness of the recycling process itself? Could the use of thermomechanical and chemical processes 
actually make recycling more harmful for the environment? Ooh, I don't know who asked that, but I love that question. Um, it's a it's a great question. Um, yes, absolutely, it can. Um, it's it's actually so it's it's a great question for so many reasons. But one of the key things that I've and I've like I said in the beginning, I've been working with with this topic for over a decade now, and there's definitely some recycling solutions that are more harmful than good for the environment. Um, there's there's one technique there. I actually have a paper on a on a solution that's using organic solvents. And organic solvents are good because they kind of dissolve some of the layers and basically you can separate the panel. Like you see in this picture, you can separate the panel into different different layers. But as it turns out, the um, hazardous uh, emissions of the amount of solvents that you need ends up being worse for the environment in so many different categories than the benefits that you get from recycling. So a key part of what we do at SolarCycle, um, and this is part of what my technology team does, is we run life cycle assessments on all the processes and you know potential processes that we're going to deploy. And if the process, obviously the process needs to work, it needs to be technically feasible, it needs to be economically feasible, but it also needs to be sustainable. And we've encountered more than once, you know, processes that are good, you know, work really well, they are economic, but they're not uh, environmentally friendly. In other words, they do more harm than good. So, and this is a key thing at SolarCycle is precisely to quantify through these studies, through these life cycle assessments, what is the net benefit of what we're doing on, and whether it's going to be positive or not. So great question. And it, just because it's recycling doesn't mean it's going to be good. Excellent. Um, has SolarCycle partnered with installers to guarantee recycling from day one of installation? Yeah. Um, good question too. We, we have, as a matter of fact, um, we are launching uh, the first of its kind contract in which the um, from the there's basically two innovations that we did recently. One is uh, at the time of purchase, you can uh, choose to per to you know add a dollar or whatever the the cost is per panel and ensure that the panel is going to be recycled at the end of life. This money goes into an escrow account, so it doesn't matter if you know solar cycle is here in the future or the manufacturers in the future. There is going to be a fund to be able to recycle that panel when time comes. So that's one innovation that we did recently. Another one is working with PPAs, that you know your um, power providers and um, utility companies to be able to uh, pre-fund the end of life uh, waste treatment before you deploy a solar farm. So think about you know we're negotiating contracts with your local government, and part of that contract is you know what is going to be done for the uh, the communities around, and basically can come in and already have a plan pre-funded of end of life. So absolutely, we're doing that already. Awesome. All right. Um, with the learning rate you mentioned, um, there there may be less valuable materials to extract out of each panel as we go into the future. Could that break the economics such that the cost of recycling becomes too expensive compared to what you get out of it? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so if you're doing recycling, you're purely, purely doing the recycling, um, and you don't have the economies of scale, absolutely. It just becomes a bigger um, barrier to enter the market, right? Um, on the flip side, if you are already at, with big economies of scale such that you can reduce the price significantly, and if you're making value-added products, like our case, then you're not only tied to the business of recycling, you actually have all these different levers that you can pull to be able to be sustainable. So, you know, because we are creating this business and we're, we're here for the long run. We're not here to make, you know, a quick buck and, and, and run. Um, we have thought about this and we have created the business in a way that we're uh, basically protected from these different things. And, you know, it's also a good thing, right? We're not pushing anyone to increase the amount of silver just because it would be good for recyclers. We need the silver content to be able, to go down to be able to, you know, achieve net zero, which is has to always be our first goal um, whenever we talk about the renewable energy space. Um, as many non-solar dudes think that the market entry in terms of technology entry level is quite low for recycling, how do you see this and how to stay competitive in this arena and have a competitive edge? That's another good question. Um, it, it's definitely a challenge because if we look at a solar panel, right? So let, let, look at, let's look at this picture here that I'm sharing. Um, the low hanging fruit here is the aluminum frame, but right? you can get, you know, 30 to 40% of the revenue from the materials just with that aluminum frame right there. And you don't need fancy machinery to do that. You can even do it manually. You can have you know a couple of people and you start doing this manually. Um, then the next 
uh, you know, big piece is the precious metals in the middle. And this is the hardest piece to get. This is about 3% of the weight, right? So very little material, 3% of the weight and over 50% of the value. Um, so what this means is if you have an operation, uh, you know, quick and dirty operation, you can just take the aluminum frame and dump the rest. And I know of many industries that do that today, right? You just take the, you know, get the best of the rest kind of thing. Yeah. You don't have to incur any of the cost of doing the harder parts of the material and you just land for the rest. Um, that has been a customary practice in the, in the business. And anyone that's not, you know, too worried about this can probably fall into that trap because that's going to be the easiest thing to do. But what we've seen is, you know, our customers in particular, they're worried about, you know, they want to do the right thing and they're worried about compliance or worried about um, what's going to happen if, you know, these materials are uh, found later and, you know, there's our logo in there or there's our name associated with them and we get, you know, a hefty fine or even what's going to happen with our image, right, if that happens. Mm -hmm. So because of this, you know, customers have been more and more diligent on their process and they're like really looking under the hood. They come visit our facilities and come see what we're doing. And that's where we win. If it's just, you know, cost and like, let's go for the cheapest cost, solar cycle would not win because that's not the business that we're here for. We're here for the long run and trying to really extract the most resources out of those panels. And then over time, because we're extracting more resources and more value, uh, be able to lower that cost of recycling to the point in which it's a no brainer, like I said before. So there is a way for somebody to do it quick and dirty, yeah, but it doesn't absolutely. drive. And there's, yeah. and there are industries today out there that will do that, right? There are, there are industries that basically, you know, shred the whole thing and get rid of it somehow. Sometimes even to the detriment of uh, human health, because some panels, there are some panels that have different chemistries. And, you know, if you start putting these chemistry without really removing the, um, the hazardous materials into roll bed, for instance, then this is going to leach out, contaminate the water beds, um, contaminate the environment. So the panels are great. They're not, they're made to last in the field forever. They're not going to leach anything if left to their own devices. But once you start messing with them, like shredding them up and not really caring about the process, that's when you start incurring into, you know, bigger problems. And the industry as a whole, the, the solar industry, they, they understand that. They want to be, you know, they want to care for their own industry. And that's why we've been seeing uh, good partners come up and really do the diligence. But yes, you absolutely can get um, the, the quick and dirty uh, things out there. All right. Um, so the last question I see in the chat, uh, how does the cost of the recycled materials compare to the cost of raw materials? Are you ledger leveraging ITC domestic content to ensure competitive cost? And there's quite a few here. Is there a point where the cost of the recycled materials will be more competitive without those tax benefits? Um, yes, we're, we are leveraging the tax benefits. Um, absolutely. That is part of the, the reason why we're, you know, marching forward with this glass plant before um, we are our plans were to do that a bit later, but you know this accelerated a lot of things. Um, so today, the, the the problem is really not the cost of recycled content material. That's uh, it's on par, I would say, with the raw materials. The problem is just uh, reliability and volumes, right? So the industries that take these raw materials, they require um, a certain standard and they require a certain volume over time, reliably. Mm. And we've been getting there. We've been getting, you know lately we've been getting more and more volumes, and that starts to open up the market, but they've seen in the recycling world a lot of variability when it comes to quality, and they've seen a lot of variability when it comes to volumes. And they can't have their whole manufacturing process dependent on a industry that's variable. So as you know, this matures and as we get more uh, bigger volumes and uh, bigger scale, that's easier for us to come in and introduce our materials as raw materials for other industries. But um, answering your question directly, yes, absolutely, we've been, um, we've been uh, uh, leveraging the tax benefits from the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Act, those things have really uh, helped us, not necessarily directly, but also indirectly, just because of the amount of solar manufacturing that has been coming to the country since the introduction of these um, of these uh, acts, right? These have, things have basically propelled the industry forward, and the manufacturing industry requires raw materials and domestic materials, and that's where we come in and supply those materials. Excellent. Well, that was the last question in the chat. Lots of really great presentations. Thank you so much. Great work. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the comments. Um, so I would say if you want to unmute yourself, if you have a direct question, please feel free. Otherwise, um, thank you so much for lending us your time this evening. And yeah, I want to definitely thank uh, Dr. Pablo Diaz for giving us this wonderful presentation.
we will post the recording of this session to our YouTube channel that you can find through our website. So if colleagues of yours were not able to make it, please feel free to share the link with them. Um, and in addition, we'll make sure that the slides are available as well, if that's okay. I think that that's a, it, it's a, it's a, a fascinating concept. And I think that the more that we can think about the, the production and consumption cycle in this way, I think the better off we all will be in how we treat uh, our environment and what we leave for those who come after us. Mm -hmm. So Good with morning. that, I'll stop Thank talking. And, Thanks uh, for being here and listen. Appreciate it. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, please feel free. Thank you.